So the worst is used for a type of a landscape, which is, which is typical when a rod gets dissolved by water or as the term karst normally used. But in Slovenia, we also have a typical or a part of Slovenia on the uh, western southern side. It's actually a name of a karst or in Slovenia, we call it kras. So when I'm going to re be referring to this part of Slovenia, I'll call it kras, even though the translation is karst, but just to be, to, to try to distinguish between karst as a term of a landscape or a part of Slovenia. And then in addition, we also have a village in the kras called kras. So it's, a, it's quite confusing sometimes, but normally, it's quite, uh, you can distinguish between the terms how they used in, in, in the language. To look a bit at the history, the, the, the karst landscape was always quite intriguing because it, the, the water were disappearing and coming again from the ground. So that was quite uh, mysterious at the time. So in the 17th century, a uh, natural historian, his name was Janez Vajkal Dvarazor, first researched the karst phenomena in Slovenia. He also wrote a book, and in that book, he described this karst phenomena quite in detail, and he also used the first time in the written uh, language the name karst. And he also used different names for the landscape, landscape forms of karst, like Doline and Uvala or Polje, which are still now used for naming the, land, the karst landscape forms. So he's considered to be a father of research or the karst of the whole world. And uh, he was later on accepted to be in the Royal Society, English Royal Society of London member in the 18th century. So this is how the figure, which is sort of in, in brown, shows you how he thought that the, the, the underground is interconnected and how the water sort of appears and disappears in the, the part of the crass, which is called the Cietnica Intermittent Lake. So if we now go to karst, which as a term, it's formed when the water dissolved soluble rock. So the rock could be either limestone or dolomite. But in this case, today I'm going to be only referring it to the limestone landscapes. So the, 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 the river sort of runs on, on, on the top of the surface comes to in the cars to the cars uh, field and sort of goes winds around the cars fields and then disappears so the a lot of a big part of the water actually runs under the ground in the drainage system which actually can't be visible on the surface and in the meantime while the, the water dissolves the rock it forms different landscape features so we have a feature which is called, I mean, I used the translator, translations which I could find, but basically we call it scraple or scrapes and grooves, which are basically formed in the sloping terrain, more in the alpine region. And the depressions could be, could, between these rocks could be from a few centimeters to a few meters deep. The difference is that the, the grooves are more parallel and they are a lot elongated uh, in comparison to the scrapes. Then we have a form which is called vartacha or a, a small sinkhole, we would say. So it's like a bowl with a flat bottom and the bottom is filled with a red soil and it's called the soil is called terra rosa and it's uh, very fertile. So the, the the farmers would normally have a small field at the bottom of Vartacha. And then if more of these small sinkholes join together, they form an uvala or a bigger sinkhole or a cove. Uh, so the sort of depends on how the landscape is formed. And then 
we have a lot of other forms like natural stone bridges and different shapes, depends how the water shaped the rocks. The most, per, uh, per, uh, the biggest sort of landscape is the karst field. Normally the river starts at one end of the karst field, winds over the field and then goes underground in the end, the other end of the field. If, of the, if the heavy rains are in spring, the field normal, normally fills up and it forms an intermittent lake. They are quite popular in Slovenia and they, they quite, quite a lot of them around. Uh, and they form, they come, they, they sort of, they, they spread to up to a half of a kilometer wide when the lake is formed. And when it's summertime and there is drought, all the river and the water disappears on the ground and the fields are managed either by mowing or by grazing former either wet or dry grasslands. All the, the settlements are therefore pushed to the edges of the fields and they're more or less spread around the whole perimeter of the potentially full lake. So we have a, a one uh, case in Slovenia. So if you if you consider now that we have a one river, it sort of flows and disappears and flows and disappears. And we have one river, which is actually one and the same river, but it's got seven different names because it appears over the seven different uh, karst fields. And every time when it reappears again, it's got a different name because in the past they didn't know it was one and the same river. And this river it's called Ljubljanica. Uh, the, big, the biggest sort of underground form which is formed in Karst are underground caves. In Slovenia, currently in the register, we have around 13,000 underground caves. And each year there's a few hundred discovered anew. They are all entered in the National Register and they have a special status of vulnerable national uh, features and they are protected as such. The majority of them are closed for public and it's only a few of them which can be visited if you are a tourist. Uh, so the tourists uh, the, the caves are either in the mountains area, so even if you are 2,000 meters above sea level, you could still have an underground cave. So in alpine caves, we have a lot of snow because it's a uh, constant low temperature, and we have, then we have snow caves. The snakes could have either running water or lakes, or they could also be dry under the ground. So the biggest cave open to public in Slovenia, it's called the Postojna cave. It's the tunnels have a length of the 24 kilometers. And that's why there's a little train running the tourists around. Uh, so they are able to see uh, the, the, the whole distance of the tunnels. So that there are different rooms, we call them rooms in the caves and then adjoined tunnels which sort of connect this room together. There's a lot of stalagmites and stalactites in the cave and they, when they join, they, call, they form a color, we call it. So the cave have a constant temperature, normally it's around 10 plus degrees and if they have a very specific uh, animal living in them, the more, a lot of them are endemic to the dinaric karst system, sort of spreading from Slovenia and a bit also to the Croatia. So endemic meaning they only live in this part of the world. We have a, a very unique blind cave salamander, which is around 20, 15 to 20 centimeters long and it's blind it's, and it's the biggest underground uh, salamander in the world uh, and it only lives in this system and then is uh, there is also a specific var variety of it 
and it's very, very rare, even more than this one, and it's a black version of it. We also call it a human fish because its, its skin has the same color as a human, human skin. Then is another cave which is also open to public. It's called Scotian Cave. And it, it's, uh, it has the largest underground canyon in the whole Europe. It's, uh, the tunnels reach as far as six kilometers. And uh, due to, to its uniqueness, uniqueness, it's enrolled in the UNESCO World Heritage, uh, Heritage. and it's also a Ramsar site, which is a special site for the protection of wetlands because it's got a, 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 a river running through it, through the whole length. Uh, so the, the, but the karst, it's not just rich under the ground. It also holds very diverse habitats and species. So on the top, we normally have grasslands. They either dry or wet, depending if they are in the karst field or more on the slopes. And the best part of the karst is also covered by forests. So we, if we quickly run through it, there's a lot of different habitats. So I, I, I try to join them into sort of groups to be a bit easier. So we have gra grasslands which cover the more slopey terrain. So where water runs off, so it's very scarce and they're very dry. And then normally, uh, since they are on slopes, they are not threatened by, by intensification of agriculture. These grasslands are normally in a good condition because they are natural grasslands and they don't need to be managed to, to, for its conservation. They are very rich in, in flora and fauna and a lot of orchid species uh, grow on them. And they're also quite rich in birds and, and snakes and other uh, reptiles. So I've, I've named the official names of them and I put the, the code of the European habit, uh, according to European Habitat Directive for the ones who are more at home at the botany. So the second group of grasslands are semi-natural grasslands. So that means that they need some kind of management to be protected or to be uh, for the, their conservation. So we have a uh, Submediterranean grasslands and uh, semi-natural grasslands of Festuco Brometalia, which I think it's similar to Bern, I think. Maybe you can correct me. Uh, and they need management. So if they, they are not mowed or grazed, they get overgrown. And this also poses the biggest threat to the gra these grasslands and all of these the group of these grasslands are endangered to the, due to the either intensification of agriculture or the land abandonment. So these areas are also quite uh, species rich. They are, have host a lot of uh, different uh, butterflies and birds. For example, we have an owl, bulbo bulbo, uh, or a green lizard. Um, and a, a very diverse uh, butterfly, uh, a, lot of it, uh, a lot of butterfly species. Then we come to a more wet grassland, so where water stays, uh, tends to stay for a longer period or also over the summer. They are either Molinia meadows or hay meadows. Uh, they also semi-natural, means, which means they have to be managed by, by humans, which also pose them a threat for their uh, conservation and they're also in a bad condition due to, to the unsustainable management. They host a very diverse, uh, as all the others, orchid species, uh, butterfly uh, species, 
let's say a Siberian iris is quite unique and then we also have one of the flex species a co is a corn crake. It's a ground nesting bird which is quite threatened by, by early uh, mowing or grazing. And then we have forests. We have either forests with, with uh, whole oak, which the oaks get to be quite old and they are re really old forests, or they are Illyrian phagos forests, but they tend to be species rich in comparison to the, to the classical phagos forests, which you normally find in the central Europe. These forests are more or less in, in good condition, uh, since if you remember I, managed, I, I mentioned that we have more of the 60% of Slovenia still covered by forest. We have a special management of forests, which is under the jurisdiction of the Slovenia Forest Service. And uh, the logging is actually a selective logging, and each tree has to be marked by this Slovenia Forest Service in order to be cut down. So our forests are actually quite in a good condition in comparison to maybe some countries elsewhere in Europe. So just to quickly look through all the different statuses that we find in this area. So as I mentioned, all the capes are these valuable features of national importance. Then we have a Ramsar site, which is a site for protection of wetlands. Natura 2000 networks. We have two parks. One is a regional park and one is a landscape park. And in addition, there is the area is also a UNESCO, UNESCO biosphere reserve. So even though we have all these statuses, we also we still need to have quite a lot of uh, projects to try to preserve the richness of the flora and fauna. Maybe just to have a quick overview of the history of the area. So the first settlements were noticed in the Neolithic area. So it's around 5,000 years uh, BC. So it's in the stone, stone Age where there were already permanent settlements and the people were, were, uh, were having small herds of sheep and goats. And maybe the, 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 the biggest discovery is a wooden wheel, which dates 5,000 years before uh, BC. It's actually the oldest wheel in the world, which is wooden, was found in this area. And then the richest era of the Kras was actually between the, first, the second and the first millennium of the BC where well, there are a lot of uh, the different settlements around Karst area, and we can still find around 200 archeological sites from that area. Maybe just to name a few of them, a lot of the caves at the time were either used for living or burial or prayer, prayer um, occasions. So, one of the most important caves, caves in this, this uh, region is it's called Mushia Cave. And they were in, in when they were doing, doing all the research in archaeology, they found objects as far as, far as from Pannonian lowland all the way to Greece in this cave. That meant that at that time this cave was quite important as a religious, religious um, uh, and uh, as a praying uh, place for the whole region. We also have a bronze situla from that area, er, era, which uh, also had already inscriptions in, in, uh, in Roman letters at the time, which was the first inscriptions in Slovenia that we could find in the archaeological findings. To, to jump a, a few decades and then we come to the Roman time in Slovenia, 
which was quite uh, extensive. Slovenia at the time was basically at the crossroads between the Roman Empire and the Lyrian provinces and the Huns and the North. And the, mo the border was moving between these uh, provincialities uh, right across the Kras region. So Roman em uh, uh, emperor uh, put up a colony called Alquilea in 180 BC, just west of Slovenia, in order to be able to progress further east and get new land and new provinces more east from Slovenia. So, as I said, Slovenia was on the crossroads. That's why the Romans built a wall in the 216, between 216 and 270 year. It's called Claustra Alpino Lirium, which was basically spreading along the whole line from the coast to the Alps, through the Karst region, and was protecting the Roman Empire be be uh, before the intrusions of the Huns from the, from the east. The remains of this wall are still visible in nature at the time. And uh, this was quite an extensive uh, archaeological, uh, quite extensive archaeological site still in Slovenia. But the Romans uh, were also important for the other reasons. They were quite uh, big tradesmen, so they were putting up trading routes to the east through Slovenia. And these yellow lines are national roads that were built at the time by Romans. There were cities of Emona, which is at the time was quite an important trading city, which is now a capital of Slovenia, of Ljubljana. And further east was a Petovia. Uh, which was just before the border uh, to the, the, the Pannonian lowland, which is now called, called Ptuj. So the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, were be, building the roads on the expense of the, the, pub, the Republic of, uh, or the public of uh, Rome. Uh, and they were also protecting the roads. Uh, against intrusions. In the sixth and the fifth and the sixth century, so the Roman rule weakened in this area due to more frequent intrusions from the Huns. And finally, around the fifth century, the Huns passed Slovenia on their conquest of Rome and also ruined most of the architecture, Roman architecture, which was present at the time. Then to quickly jump through the thousand years later on, then the most important was the first Slavic tribal principle around 800 AD, which is called Carniola. And then in the 800 AD, there was a Frankish state uh, governancy over the Slovenia, which first organized land into, into counties. So they first had appointed counts to the land of Slovenia. In the, in the 11th century, there was a feudal system uh, put up in Slovenia, which gave rulers a uh, ruling over the counties to certain uh, bishops and, and so. And they also started to build, put up castles. This is quite sort of traditional in that, that, that era. And we have quite a few castles still in the era from, from that time. And the other thing which happened in the feudal system was that the, the land was divided into different ownership. This was the first time that was actually decided to divide the land. Later on in the 13th century, this was probably quite the most important for later on, under the ruling of the Habsburg monarchy, you all know probably Maria Theresia. It was in Slovenia, it was very important because she introduced compulsory schooling for everybody in Slovene language already in the 18th century. But not just that, she, already, she also uh, had all the land divided 
and uh, the landmarks were put in the soil and the first uh, catastral maps were drawn of the area and the land could then be sold to a new owners and uh, farmers. So that was really important for the area because we get a private ownership of the land for the first time. And when somebody bought this land, the land was full of rocks, as you could imagine, and they were quite dry areas. So first what they did, they put all the rocks onto the edges of their land plots and start building dry walls. At the beginning they were quite, uh, let's say, simple, but then they became quite complex. They started to put a bit more uh, uh, organized rocks, sometimes also in two columns. And I think they look quite similar to the burns. So uh, we, here we have a similar system of putting dry, dry walls. And the, this dry wall construction was also uh, enlisted in the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage, and they're quite important in this area still now. But the, the weather is quite harsh in, uh, in, in Kras. So to protect themselves from the summer heat, for the quick storms, from the shelter of the wind, which is called Bura, which can be quite hard here in these places, they started putting little houses on the fields for themselves. They are called Hishka or a stone house. Uh, we still have around 400 of them preserved still now in the nature and they are quite important cultural heritage in the area. As I said, the, the, the water is very scarce. If it does rain, it uh, runs off very, very quickly. So the people started putting up ponds. So they, they laid the bottom of a pond with a clay. They pushed it very hard so it doesn't leak water anymore. And now the, on the uh, outer edges, they started building walls and started collecting water for the dry, dry parts of the year. And there are quite important features around in the countryside and it's quite a lot of them still around. And they are very important habitat of different um, uh, amphibians and reptiles. Oh, okay, the more recent uh, cultural heritage or so. I'm not if you're familiar with it, but somebody probably heard we have there is a, a Vienna, it's a, it's, it's a riding school in Vienna, it's quite famous. And they always use a Lipizzana horse. A Lipizzana horse is a special breed which comes from a small village called Lipica. It's in the Kras region. And the horses are bred outside and they are bred into this specific horse, which is called a Lipizzana horse. And they are used for normally for, for uh, horse school uh, riding. And this, uh, the stud, uh, Lipica farm, has been uh, declared as a national cultural monument just recently. But all of this uh, it ba is basically, it's, uh, it poses a lot of threats either to the natural or to cultural uh, heritage, by either agriculture, which can be uh, intensive. So we have a frequent uh, mowing and, to, and, uh, and, and uh, frequent uh, grazing and silage of the, of the grass. All this poses threats to the, to the grasslands. And we also have quite a few invasive species uh, sort of threatening the, the native flora and fauna. That's on one hand. And on the other hand, where the, key, the, the, the land gets more steep, we have a problem on land abandonment because they are hard to manage. There are steep slopes. People tend to, uh, to leave the, 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 the small farms and go to the cities and the land gets abandoned and overgrown, which also poses a threat since this, uh, these are semi-natural grasslands which need constant management in order 
uh, to be restored or otherwise they get grown, grown and go back to the forest. So we have quite a few projects uh, around. At the beginning, I'm going to be talking about region of Kras, the projects of region of Kras. So there are a few projects dealing with cultural and natural heritage at the same time. We have a project uh, called Living Landscapes, which, which had an extensive um, series of workshops for the teaching people how to do the drywall construction and this uh, Hishke construction or the shepherd's houses. Then we have another Kakarshan uh, Kras, which is uh, basically uh, overviewing the whole uh, where the existing uh, dry walls are still present. Then we have two projects, Klaustra and Klaustra Prus. Which, all, which uh, focus on the Roman uh, remainings in, in the field. So they did, uh, uh, they monitored the location and the status. They produced a guide to the Roman, uh, the, the wall, which I was mentioning, the claustra wall. And they also uh, removed the extensive overgrowth over this uh, land, the, this, uh, monuments or in, uh, remaining walls of the Roman era and also produced the 3D drawings of how they used to be, uh, used to look like and uh, had an extensive campaign for, for raising awareness of the Roman uh, heritage in Slovenia. Then we have uh, a lot of projects on nature conservation. These two are connected to the Kras region they, uh, they work a lot of the activities to, for either dry or wet grasslands. So in this case, we have a big um, uh, activities for, uh, for restoring water courses on the grass uh, fields. And we have uh, a lot of campaigns for the owl. I'm not sure if we have the same problem in Ireland, but in our case, the owls gets get electrificated on the open uh, poles of the electricity. So the poles were protected and uh, against um, this uh, electrification of owls. There's, there were a lot of activities going on to clean up the caves and uh, against illegal capturing of these endemic animals in the caves. Then we had the activities for the amphibians. We had we produced new ponds, reconstructed some of the old ones, and uh, and constructed the tunnels for the amphibians to cross the roads. And on the other hand, we had um, we we introduced or let's say promoted sustainable management of grassland by grazing. There's another project again. So this is on the other part. It's called on the on the Cirknica Lake, intermittent lake. They are restoring old water courses. They have a lot of uh, activities for the public. They are producing quiet zones to watch to watch the bird life. In this case, uh, also a corn cracks, and they have extensive paths running around the Cirknica Lake that informs the visitors of the importance. This is also a site for a, a meadow squill. I'm not sure if you have it, but it's one of the rare sites in Slovenia, uh, which is restored in this project. And there are also activities for bats and amphibians, like construction of ponds. And in Slovenia, we have a lot of these uh, church bells, bell towers, which now gets the, 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 the the bell windows get closed normally now with meshes. And that means that the, the, the bats can't nest anymore. So there was a lot of uh, educational campaign going on in protection of bats to try to restore the roosting places for the bats. And there's another uh, 
project called Stargen, which is doing similar thing. So it's re restoring another part of, uh, of uh, dried water courses on the karst fields. Then we come to the, new, to the project, which is basically on the eastern part of Slovenia. It's called Conservation of Management of Grasslands in Eastern Slovenia. It was taking part of four different areas across Slovenia. Uh, species reaches dry grasslands in mountain race areas and in, uh, in hilly areas, which this is also species rich habitat, uh, orchid rich habitat. So uh, the threats were similar to the ones already mentioned, which is uh, too intensive farming or uh, no farming at all. So we wanted to restore uh, sustainable farming in the area, similar to the live burn, which you probably know. This is how a typical farm would, would look like. So it's a very small farm, around 3.5 hectares. And even in this 3.5 hectares, we have a bit of grasslands and a bit of forests and a bit of orchards. So we removed the overgrowth in, on nearly 140 hectares. We put up fences on 100. 13 kilometers for grazing and through the project we assured extensive management of nearly 600, uh, 670 uh, hectares of grasslands. So the project brought the mach special machinery for mowing uh, on the very steep terrain and uh, pulled up fences and put all this equipment for free use of the farmers. In addition, it restored 83 hectares of tall tree orchards. These are orchards which are either mown or grazed underneath. They are tall fruit trees. And we planted nearly 3,500 saplings of different uh, varieties of old fruit trees, which we produced from a national bank. So we try to restore the regional genetic diversity of fruit trees also in nature. And in addition, we also wanted to support pollinators conservation, redirecting the 25 insect hotels, which were either for uh, pollinators conservation or for public awareness. Uh, we also, so the whole project uh, had a result-based approach similar to the to the burn program so thanks to the brendan who sort of uh, uh, exchanged knowledge with us and we learned a lot from from the burn so we set up a similar system in slovenia so we are measuring results so the farmer does not does manage uh, on his best opinion and then we only the score presence of indicator plants. We had a lot of trainings with farmers, uh, how to manage the field and how to do the self-assessment of the conservation status of the grasslands. Um, and in addition, we also had some supporting uh, activities. We developed a collective trademark called from the slopes, the grassland slopes. And we supported farmers with the knowledge and uh, the different uh, activities. So they started producing uh, products on the farm. So they would have either milk or milk products, meat or meat products and fruit products. We also bought some equipment for processing the food. We organized uh, uh, an evaluation of, uh, evaluation of the products and we got 135, I think, different product, products from dry grasslands for evaluation. And um, uh, so they could now be tra traded under the brand of uh, this uh, trademark of, from grasslands. We all had a lot of uh, support activities for raising awareness and the general public and a special concern was also given for the education of the youth. So uh, I hope this is a, a quick overview of the activities. 
Uh, I hope we see a lot of these pictures. So we have uh, in front, we have a hematoglossum orchid. Uh, and in the back, we have uh, cows uh, moving the area with a tall tree orchard at the back. And we hope we see a lot of this in the future. This is the contact if somebody wants to contact me later on. So feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you. Nika, that was wonderful. It was fantastic. I was particularly taken with the with the shepherds' houses. <laughs> were they were they actually used for shelter or were they used for any long term accommodation? No, they were just used for the shelter. They only shelter up to twelve people, so they were small. So they were just for the weather, harsh weather conditions, which yeah. changed quite quickly in this area. Yeah, they're beautiful. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. If anyone has questions for Nika, please feel free to send them in using the chat button. Um, I'm sure, Brendan, you have a few questions. I might ask a couple that have already come in into the chat button. Um, Connor Fahi had asked, um, have you taken many steps to preserve the concrete? Yes, there are quite a few projects uh, targeting concrete. And uh, just the recent one, which was uh, was also to develop a special uh, result-based payment scheme for corncrake, which uh, which gives a, a extra bonus for the farmers which host a concrete on their fields. But then we have also on-field conservation extras for 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 the management of the wet grasslands of the corncrake. Okay. Um... Is the turlock exactly the same as polia? Is it? Is that what you call? Do you know what? It, is it a seasonal water um, resource? The the ponds or which one do you mean? Polia. A polia, the karst. Yeah. Yeah, that's the karst field basically. Yes. So it's either either the only the river runs through it, or when it's extensive rain, then it, the field fills up with water, forming a lake. So the lake could be. 10 kilometers wide when it's full, but then in summer, then it disappears when it's dry and they're just meadows. It sounds like what we call uh, turlocks ah, okay. in Ireland. Yes, that was, that was the question. Um, uh, Shirley Clarkin has said, lucky to visit Slovenia and must say it is a wonderful place, wonderful people and people and heritage and so many orchid species that Brendan Dunford were swoon. <laughs> um, is Brendan here? Sure yeah, maybe I there. didn't mention, but I think on the fields you get 300 different butterfly species and 25 different bat species. I think it's only 30 bat species in the whole Europe and 25 of them you can get in Karst region. So anybody who's into bats should visit Karst in Slovenia. Fantastic. Brendan, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um... Um, so thanks so much, Nika. I think that was absolutely wonderful um, talk, full of information and beautiful images. Um, just fascinating in terms of your approach to conserving those special places. I was really lucky to visit Nika um, a couple of years back to look at the project and to see the work there. And it really is, it's world class, I think. Uh, but I was going to say, Nika, that one, one, one lingering memory that I have of Slovenia, particularly in the east, are these small mixed farming systems. And you showed some pictures there of them. And I found it extraordinary. Like, and these very sm small holdings, you had an area of forest for, for fuel and for um, gathering and for, um, uh, for some livestock browsing. You had your meadows, um, which were just full of the most extraordinary orchids and diversity I've ever seen, which were used for fodder for cattle. Then you had your tall orchards, which you used for fruit, and then you had your um, small gardens. So it was the, like an idyllic um, version of, of what some of us dream farming to be like. But the holdings are very small, and I guess some of the people are quite elderly as well because they're not necessarily that economically viable. So how are you dealing with that, or how are you trying to deal with that, um, keeping young people farming in those traditional ways and avoiding, um, you know, the kind of land consolidation or, you know, the intensification or abandonment that, that happens um, elsewhere. In the national city, there is a subsidy for, we call it uh, farming in the areas of limiting factors. I'm not sure if it's in the cup or it's just in Slovenia. So they have, a, they get a special subsidy if they farm. 
But normally that's not enough. As you said, the farms are really small and they're not economically viable. So that's why we had this huge campaign of trying to get a new vision for the farmers to produce products from these diverse areas and they are really high quality products and they could be sold in a, on, a, on a high price. And I think this is the vision. I mean, we, ha we had a lot of good uh, feedback from the farmers when we had all these trainings. I think they, 18 of them already thought about preparing an additional activity on the farm for selling the products. We also did some networking between the farmers and the, the, the consumers. So some hotels now offer the local products from the farms and so on. So I think this is the future, combining both. Some subsidies from the state and some additional effort from the farmer to be a bit more uh, open to new ideas and new markets, I think. Okay. Thanks, Mika. Margaret Ringensberg says, uh, so heartwarming to see the attention being paid to restoring and protecting Slovenia's land and antiquities. Um, so Slovenia seems so well managed. <laughs> so that's down to you, Mika. Is countryside perfect and idyllic? And it really is. It's just so beautiful. Uh, so thank you. Um, there's some explanations about turlocks and polishes here in, in, in the thing. David McNicholas has a question. Are you hopeful that the poor conservation status of the semi-natural grasslands will improve with the implementation of the new management measures or is there a growing tendency toward intensification? Unfortunately, there's still intensity, uh, intensity to either go into intensive fields in the lowlands or land abandonment. So I think if they're not going to be any support from the state in the view of some subsidies from farming uh, these areas are going to be still in conservation decline so it's uh, they're quite specific and uh, as you said they are really they're not big plots they are very small plots that means it's even harder to manage and this they are very steep some of these areas are like the, the slope is 60 percent which means it's nearly impossible to manage. So you really need an effort to keep on farming these areas, unfortunately. So we, that's why we have so many projects, it's because it's so hard to put this effort just on the farmer. I think the farmers need support to keep on managing these specific species of grasslands. Okay, um, thanks, Nick. Another question here from Jim Ryan. I think I know you, Jim. Um, are there problems with water quality in the wetlands? Um, some in some areas, if the wetlands are in lowlands, we get to have uh, pollution from the uh, just uh, joint uh, farming land. That's sometimes a problem. But uh, I think we have some hope in the new cup because wetlands are going to have a special position in the next cup. So we hope we will have this this threat is going to be less obvious in the future. But uh, the other thing is some of the wetlands got drained in the past. That was also the other, the other sort of threat to the wetlands. And we, as you saw, that's why so a lot of projects which are dealing with the grasslands now have restoration of all the water courses in one of the activities. This was also the threat, which was more or less in the past, but they're not drained anymore currently. And Nick, a couple of other kind of questions um, before I hand back. Um, are the issues of or like the interface between tourism and some of these protected areas, some of these farmed areas, is that a problem? And secondly, the, the, the question that keeps popping up is with regard to climate uh, change and um, has that had an impact on, on the conservation status and the management of some of the, the habitats you described? Uh, tourism wasn't really isn't really, only in some places, it isn't really a problem because tourism in Slovenia is not really intensive. It tends to be more green tourism on farm stays. Only some very popular touristic spots are more under threat, but not really the countryside. So I wouldn't say tourism is a threat. I think it's actually supporting some of the farms because they have little farm stays with one or two apartments and uh, I don't know, offering local uh, food for, for 
they are tourists. So I think it's actually supporting small farms. I wouldn't say that the countries are threatened by tourism. Uh, but the, the climate change, I wouldn't say it's got such a big effect on the grasslands yet, but some on the forest, it's got an effect because not, not so much in the car, limestone area, but Al our Alps are covered with the pine forest and the, with the climate change, the temperatures are rising and they're not suitable for pine anymore. So they are calling uh, pine, I mean, meaning uh, the alpine spruce, I think in English it's called. Uh, so the alpine spruce is actually pushed higher up into the mountains. So it's, uh, it, it's the change in the structure of the forests. It's already visible, but not so much on the grasslands. Right. Um, just a quick one here from um, Maria Long. An interesting question, um, Maria, uh, with regard to the, the farmers and the workshops. Did the farmers know some of the species names already? Uh, and did they enjoy the learning experience? We had a very positive feedback from the farmers and already also a good response. We were a bit uh, worried how that would uh, how would the farmers would react on that, but but they they had they knew the the plants. Uh, they probably had their own they had their own terms for them. Uh, so, uh, but they would make recognize them. They would say, "Oh yeah, yeah, I know this plant lives. Uh, you know, uh, it grows on my plot." uh so it was very useful for us and i think for them uh so it was neutral uh and i think they really enjoyed it fantastic listen i'm going to hand back to Pranjali, but before i do thanks again nika you never even mentioned the wonderful vineyards that you have in slovenia yeah. which is another um great reason to visit and um i know you've been here to visit us in the burn in the past and present at the burn winter school um and attend the burn uh, winters cattle drove and hopefully you see some of us from the talk here tonight back over to visit you again in Slovenia at some stage. So thank you very much, Nika, and keep up the amazing work. Um, just hand back to you, Brantley, to, to the rest. Um, thanks, Brandon. It looks like we're nearly out of time, but there's one other question uh, from Patricia McKee. Who organizes these many initiatives you have uh, given us today? Uh, there, are, there seem to be so many projects ongoing. Uh, and uh, nearly all the projects which were concerning nature conservation uh, is actually our institute. I, I work for the Institute for Nature Conservation. Um, we, we, we are either partners or managing or managing partners, our, our lead partners, how, how would you call them? Uh, so a lot of these projects which I listed today, there's many more around, but I only listed uh, telling you the truth, the ones which I knew better. Uh, so they are initiated from our institute and also joined to some joint conservation with the cultural heritage also. So let's say the ones which also have some from activities for cultural uh, heritage. But uh, on the, so I could only talk more or less on the na natural heritage part of it. <laughs> So, but there's a, there's a lot of parks around, as, as I mentioned, and also they have their own uh, additional projects to the ones, or they are partners our projects. Normally that's how it works. So they're either partners or they have their own projects. Um, and just a final question for today, for those of us who might be interested in visiting Slovenia someday and want to learn more about how um, the farmers are, you know, farming for nature, if you like, uh, the, the tourism that you mentioned, is it very, is it like a community effort to the farmers come to, is it a cooperative or are they kind of disjointed individual businesses, if you like? In the past, we had this, uh, this joint management of the area, but now more or less these small farms, they tend to go to work in the morning and then have farming as an afternoon activity, even though it's not an afternoon activity at all. Uh, so that also is a big problem in Slovenia. So in the project, we actually had some activities to try to join their work effort again. So we, let's say, we handed in one uh, specific uh, uh, mower for the specific terrain, very steep terrain, only if they adjoined into managing, let's say, 20 hectares. So we tried to connect them back together how they used to work. In, in the past, 
So they, they all worked together and just moved over the field regardless of the ownership. But then in between it got lost and everybody was taking care of just of its own farm. So we want to reintroduce some of, of the past, uh, this uh, connectivity of the farms in the area. That's fantastic. We, just, we, are, we are past nine o'clock. So I just want to thank you again, Nika, for, for joining us today. That was a fantastic presentation. We have recorded it, so we will make it available on our YouTube channel. And we will and thank you to um, over 100 people who joined us today to listen to you. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Um, we will see you again on the second Wednesday of February. I think it's 11th February or something um, where we'll hear from um, Kentucky in USA. So good night, everyone. And thanks for joining. Goodbye. Bye.